Our first Bible reading is from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Second reading is from Matthew chapter 28. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thank you for those readings and thank you again for um, welcoming me here today and for the opportunity to, to open up God's word with you. It's one of the great privileges of my job actually. I get to visit so many churches and it's, uh, it's always so encouraging to hear, um, hear from other people and to meet other people who, who love Jesus and love for him to be known by more and more uh, people. Um, and also what a tremendous opportunity for me to come down to this beautiful place. Uh, I don't need to tell you that, do I? Um, but, wow, Southern Highlands, I uh, very much enjoy coming down here, so uh, it's, it's awesome. But uh, here today we're going to think a little bit about mission, but um, I just want to share a story. First of all, I, a few weeks ago I received a, a prayer update from one of our missionaries, and uh, she's serving in the Middle East, and one of the stories that she shared in that prayer letter was to do with her language teacher, actually. She said, for the past month I've had a new language teacher, Raid is from the majority religion, Islam, but he admits that he's not particularly practicing. Now, as they've been, so all, all of our missionaries, that they will have a language teacher, uh, and as they've been working together, she shared how uh, he, this Muslim man, has started asking her questions. Uh, and he said, she said that he's been very curious to know, why do I follow Jesus if not everyone in my family is a Christian? Why did I leave my career to go into ministry? And why would I leave the comfort of Australia to come to the Middle East? They're the three questions that this Muslim language teacher is asking of this Australian missionary. And they're, they're good questions, aren't they? Why mission? Why do we do what we do as Christian? Why does a talented young woman who has so much opportunity here in Australia, why does she surrender all that for the sake of making Jesus known uh, in the Middle East? Or, or think of Adam and Avril. I'm, I'm very glad that you guys are partnered with them. They're a beautiful family, but why would they leave the comfort and safety and security of Australia to serve Jesus in one of the poorest parts of the world? And why would you spend your time praying for them, learning more about Madagascar, giving your finances to help uh, send them? Why, why do we do this? Why mission? Well, I reckon uh, this passage, Matthew 28, uh, verses 16 to 20, provides a very compelling answer for us. Three, three key reasons, actually. And I'm going to uh, speak under... Uh, three headings today. If, if you've got uh, your sheets there, if you're a note taker, you can write these headings down. A life-giving conviction, a life-giving commission, and a life-giving companion. So we're going to look at those three things, but my, my question for you, th these are well-known verses, um, well-known to many of us, but I guess my question is, and the question I've been asking myself is, are they well-heeded? Uh, do, do we really take these 
things to heart because they carry enormous weight, actually, these words, and, and they lay a mighty claim on each and every one of us. But really, these words here of Jesus, they're words that he gave to give us courage in the work of mission. And, and so I really want you to, to take these words to heart today. So let's get into it, the first heading, a life-giving conviction. As we pick up the story in Matthew 28, it's fair to say that Jesus' closest followers at this point in the story are feeling very uncertain, and that would be putting it mildly. One of their very own had just betrayed Jesus. They are no longer 12, they are 11. One of their very own, Judas, had betrayed Jesus, and as a result of that betrayal, they witnessed their beloved leader suffer the most torturous, most shameful, and most undeserved death imaginable. But you see, as all of that was unfolding, they themselves had run for their lives. As the shepherd was struck, the sheep were scattered. And so this group of men, they're in a state of absolute chaos at this point. And, you know, CMS's vision, a world that knows Jesus, if you put yourself in their shoes for a moment, can you imagine how unlikely that would be for them at this point. This lofty ideal of a world that knows Jesus, I think, would have been uh, almost a lost cause to them at this point. Except for one thing. They'd heard reports that Jesus' tomb was empty and that he'd been raised from the dead, which seems like very far-fetched news. But in verse 16, we hear the awesome way that they actually respond to this news and even though these men had run a mile and what we're seeing here is them coming together again and showing fresh signs of allegiance to Jesus and it's very encouraging take a look at that with me verse 16 it says the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go now they went to Galilee this is not just crossing the road uh, to, to, to get to the local cafe Galilee it, it took great commitment for them to, to go that distance this was a long way for them to travel. But notice the end there, it says, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Christian discipleship, as you will know, is about listening to Jesus and about faithfully trusting what he has to tell you and teach you. That's what Christian discipleship is. And, and, and what we're seeing here is that these deserters, they're starting to demonstrate discipleship again doing what Jesus told them to do, going where Jesus told them to go. And so it's a very promising turn in the story. And, and the thing is, when they get to the mountain, the reports that they heard are so powerfully and so wonderfully confirmed, aren't they? Take a look at that, verse 17. They saw him. They saw him before their very eyes. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. They fell to their knees. And do you blame them? This man had been dead. They had witnessed what had happened to him on the cross. But now, here he is before them, very much alive. And to witness that would make any knee tremble. To worship is a very natural response when you're confronted with the resurrected Jesus. But I've got to say, that's not to say that this is easy to believe. It's not. And I think we're told, we are told here very helpfully, I think, that some doubted. Some doubted. Now, that doesn't mean rank unbelief. It simply means that some were hesitant. They were, they were cautious. They found it difficult to explain what was going on here. And I can tell you that I would have been in that group. I, I, I would have... I would have had that doubt running through me. I get it. But that doubt doesn't mean it's not real. Doubt doesn't disprove reality. And I actually love how this little detail that Matthew includes here, I love how it adds so much authenticity to this story, even to those who were there. This was an extraordinary thing. Their doubt highlights that this was in no way normal. It was a very unique thing, but that's the point. It's, it's a unique thing that points to the unique truth of who Jesus really is. And there are, there are plenty of things, aren't there, in this world that command our attention. Um, a few weeks ago, I was driving my son home from 
soccer. We were on the freeway up just near the, near the bridge, near the Harbour Bridge, and we were driving along, and then I heard these sirens behind me. I looked in the rearview mirror, sure enough, police. So I've pulled to the side. The, the, the reason for the I wasn't the reason for the sirens, just to let you know. <laughs> um, but I've, I've moved across, and they, were, they roared past. But the, the point is, those sirens showed their authority. They got my attention, and I obeyed. How much more should the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead get our attention? This is not an everyday experience, and that's the point. And that's why Jesus' words in verse 18 are so important for us to hear, so vital. Take a look at that with me. Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. This is the life-giving conviction that you and I hold as Christians. The resurrection of Jesus demonstrates that he alone has the right to rule all things, in all places, and all people, through all time and beyond. That is the extent of his authority. It's not just localised to a small group of people in a small place. It's not just localised to a Sunday. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. There is not an atom in the universe, not an angel in the sky, not, a, not, a, not, a, not an angel in heaven, not a star in the sky, not, not a person in this world who does not sit under the authority of Jesus. That's how complete it is. Now, of course, it, it might be a bit understandable to, to be a bit nervous about that prospect. In our world, this sort of totalitarian power is... It gives rise to all sorts of atrocities, doesn't it? I mean, we, we just need to watch our news and we get a sense of it. People who coerce and control through force and fear just to satisfy their own agenda. That We see it all the time and it's appalling. It's wrong. We're going to recognise that the, the authority that Jesus has, the power that he has, is not exercised like that. Jesus is fundamentally governed by love, mercy, kindness, compassion. At every point, that is how he wields his power. That's the authority he has. It, it isn't oppressive, it's not tyrannical, it is liberating and empowering and life-giving. And earlier on in Matthew's Gospel, you, you remember that, that beautiful verse in Matthew eleven twenty eight: Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is so powerful. He has so much authority that he offers to carry your burden, my burden, onto himself to take the weight of our sin onto himself. That's what he does for us. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, you and me. That is the authority that he has. It is a life-giving authority, not a life-taking one. And it's, it's that conviction, isn't it, that, that ought to motivate, motivate us to help others to know Jesus? Certainly in our local community, but also in all the world. And that's why Jesus says what he says next. And the second heading uh, this morning, a life-giving commission. Because all authority has been given to Jesus, it is relevant and it is applicable for the whole world. The whole world. It, it can't be anything less. And, and that is the logical conclusion that Jesus spells out for us in verse 19. Take a look at that. He says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Uh, Matthew's Gospel, uh, the, the main agenda of, of Matthew's Gospel is to show people like you and me why Jesus is worth following. 
Uh, the very name Matthew actually means disciple and so there's this whole discipleship agenda that's going on through, through this gospel. Uh, but in this very last section, these very last verses, we see how the agenda of the gospel then becomes or it now becomes the agenda of those who follow him. This is what a true understanding of Jesus' authority should do for people like you and me. It, it, it should get us going, it should get us looking out and, and not just looking out for ourselves or, or for our, our friends and, and our family, as important as those things are, but it should also getting us looking out to the ends of the earth because Jesus doesn't just say, make disciples, does he? He says, make disciples of all nations. This is the scope of this great work and heading out with that end in mind. And I, I actually, this is one of the things I just, I love about our faith, um, the, the outward looking nature of it, uh, the desire, the longing, the, the yearning to see people from all different sorts of cultures and all different sorts of places, every tribe and nation and language and tongue to, to come together under the loving authority of Jesus. It, it is so unique to, to our faith. And, and the thing is here, Jesus does make this a command for his disciples. But it's not a command that you and I adhere to with a spirit of compliance. It, it's one that we would adhere to with a sense of commitment, compelled by his love. When I, when I tell my children to clean their bedroom, they don't really commit to that out of a sense of... <laughs> They might do it, but they're not very glad for it. But that's, that's not the sort of command that Jesus is, is doing here. He, he's, we know how good he is. And we know that the life that he offers is, is so great. Because it's a life that reconnects us with the God who created us. Jesus says that making disciples involves baptising people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And, and at its heart, what this means is that when we follow Jesus, when we become disciples of Jesus by trusting in him, we become immersed in this relationship with God himself. And what Jesus offers people like you and me across the whole world is this inseparable and perfect bond of fellowship with him, even though we don't deserve it. And there is nothing more precious, nothing better, nothing more important for the human soul than to be reconnected with their creator. And so that's our, our, our life-giving commission. But all of that leads us to the third and, and final point, And that is this life-giving companion. We ought to be motivated by mission because we have a very, very great companion. I, I love Matthew 28. I hope that's evident. Um, but over time, as I've sat with this passage and as I've prepared this talk, there is one word that just always leaps out of the page at me. And it's a word that I have grown to have a deep appre appreciation for over the last few years. And it's simply the word with. Uh, you might think I'm a bit loopy going on about a preposition. <laughs> but this word is a beautiful word. Surely I am with you, Jesus says, to the very end of the age. See, this word with, it, it conveys connection and closeness. It communicates togetherness and intimacy. It's a, it's a word of partnership and union. And really, this word embodies so much of what we long for as human beings. Think of that whole lockdown thing. We were not with each other. And it hurt us. But you see, the thing is, this word is a word which Jesus applies to our relationship with him here and now. If we are his disciples... I am with you always to the end of the age. Remember that. What a very precious promise this is, the, the promise of companionship from the Lord of the universe to the very end of the age. 
If you're a follower of Jesus, he promises not to leave you on your own to figure out your way in this wayward world. He promises to be with you always to the very end of the age. And it's a precious thing, isn't it, to have someone who loves you be with you? To have someone who is on your side be by your side? One of the uh, most powerful, well, one of the ways that people experience, understand the power of with is when they're without. Without a job. Without a spouse. Without a home. Sometimes we only really realise the power of with when we are without. But friends, there are people who are without Jesus and who are without this beautiful connection with their creator. And friends, I want to encourage you to think about those people. When it comes to the business of cross-cultural gospel mission, this is, this is what we're all on about, helping people to reconnect with their creator. But I've got to say as well, this, this promise is very precious to those who have been sent, to our missionaries. It, uh, for, for many of them, uh, this promise is what helps them get through that day or that week or, or that season. Many of our missionaries will talk about uh, times of extreme loneliness and, and isolation uh, as they dislocated from close friends and close family here in Australia and as they enter into what are often hostile climates and contexts the, the sense of isolation and, and aloneness can really uh, can, can bear down on them, but it, often it is this truth as they read this passage that helps them to persevere, knowing that Jesus is with them by his spirit through his word. And, and friends, I want to encourage you as well in your partnership to remember that Jesus is with you as you pray, as you give, as you care. Jesus is with you just as much as he is with our missionaries. And so your partnership is genuine participation in gospel mission because of Jesus' presence. Your prayers for Adam and Avril, they will very much contribute to the work that God is doing through them. Because Jesus is with you as much as he is with them. And so there are, there are three things, uh, three things, motivations for mission. Why mission? And, uh, and I hope that these three things give you courage uh, in your mission partnership. I also hope they perhaps even might give you courage to consider going on mission. But I, I guess the, just a few encouragements in, in closing. Uh, I've got to say that I often feel uh, that this ideal to see a world that knows Jesus. I sometimes feel as though the, it feels like an impossible task. Uh, there is so much hostility, so much opposition to the Christian faith in our world now. And, and sometimes I am tempted to just bunker down and just live out my own faith. Just put the little comfortable doors around me and I'll just live out my days. But when we're confronted with Jesus' authority... We can't be satisfied with that, can we? Jesus' authority means that gospel mission is never a waste of time or energy. And so I want to, I want to encourage you in that. I think I want to encourage you too, though, with Jesus' commission urges us always to be looking out. The Christian faith, the rule is love, right? And the lo love always turns us inside out. It always makes us to look out. And I think it's, uh, it, it's so important for us to be looking out to... To sh for ways to share that gospel, a beautiful gospel, with other cultures. And, and I guess one of the questions that I want to put to you, it's a question that I often put to myself, is to what extent do you have an ends-of-the-earth perspective to your faith? To what extent do you have an ends-of-the-earth perspective to your faith? To, how much are you thinking about people in other corners of the globe? And to what extent are you thinking about the church in, in those areas? To what extent are you thinking about those who, who do not yet know Jesus? So you, to what extent do you have a, a, a geogra geographical sense of the ends of the earth, but, but also 
think about it in time as well. To what extent are we thinking about people in 20 years' time, 50 years' time, 100 years' time, 200 years' time? You know, uh, next year marks 200 years since CMS came to Australia. Uh, CMS missionaries uh, came into Sydney uh, to work amongst Indigenous people. We, we were not a sending organisation from Australia at that point, we, but 200 years that, we, that CMS has had a presence in this country. What could be happening in 200 years' time? Uh, think about those people. Have an ends-of-the-earth perspective to your faith. So I really want to encourage you in that and, and to think through with, um, with Adam and Avril. The work that they're doing at the moment, it may seem small, but how might God use that in 150 years' time? We don't know. We're probably not going to be here to see it, but we can trust that God works. And the reason why we can trust God works in that way is because we're sitting here now, 2,000 years on at the exact opposite end of the earth to where Jesus said these things. So I want to encourage you in that. And, and the final thing I want to encourage you with is please take courage from Jesus' presence. The one who commands the heavens and the earth is on your side and he is by your side. The task of gospel mission may seem very impossible, but with him, you have a very great companion. So let me pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you so much for your word. Um, we thank you so much for the way it teaches us about your son, but the way it also helps us to hear what Jesus had to say. We do thank you for the way that all authority has been given to him. We recognise that this authority uh, means that it is for all people in all places through all time. And so I just pray that you would uh, give us the courage in mission and in mission partnership to help others to make him known. And Father, as we do that, we, we do want to thank you so much for the, the wonderful gift of his presence with us and help us to remember that to the very end of the age. Amen.